Our next conversation is in partnership with Wellbeing Foundation Africa. And uh, if you're not familiar, under Toyin Soraki's leadership, Wellbeing Foundation Africa has really transformed Nigeria's maternal health outlook through localized training and bringing access to information, resources, and medical support directly to the patient. Wellbeing Foundation Africa is an inaugural member of the Concordia Action Alliance, and we're looking forward to working closely with them to support partnership development in global health throughout that forum. With that, I am very pleased to welcome to the Concordia Africa Initiative for this conversation around tackling health misinformation in Nigeria, Concordia Leadership Council member and founder and president of the Wellbeing Foundation Africa, Her Excellency Toyin Siraki, Vivian Ihekwezu, Managing Director of Nigeria Health Watch. We are going to try to get Dr. Olero Roberts in uh, when we're able to get her on the line. Uh, she is the Vice President of the Wellbeing Foundation Africa. And finally, Gwen Young, Senior Consultant for Women Business Collaborative and a Concordia Advisor. Gwen, over to you. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, everyone. Welcome. We're here today to talk about tackling health misinformation in Nigeria. And I'm really honored to be here today with Her Excellency Mrs. Toyin Ojora Siraki, who is the founder president of the Wellbeing Foundation in Africa, as well as Vivian Ihekwezu, the managing director of Nigeria Health Watch, to talk about what this looks like in Nigeria. So let's jump in because the topic really is pretty clear. It's health disinformation, it's accurate health information, and the question is who's responsible? Leadership, parliamentarian, policymakers, women and families. So I'm gonna start with, with you, Vivian. Is this post-COVID world ready to adopt a truly universal approach to accurate dissemination of health information? And if so, who, who is responsible for this? Thank you very much, Gwen, and um, thank you for having me on this very important panel. Um, thank you for that. In terms of um, looking or adopting a universal approach to accurate information dissemination, um, I think this would mean possibly looking at common dissemination channels to communicate health information. I think what COVID-19 showed us from the outset uh, was that consistent messaging was needed um, for people to keep on hearing the same things over and over again. And we were advised to go to trusted sources um, for COVID information in Nigeria. So for instance, WHO, uh, the Ministry of Health, um, NCDC, um, I'm sure the similar thing was replicated in other um, countries with public health institutes being sourced, uh, being called as reliable source of information. However, as we all have seen, uh, people source their information from multiple channels um, and the proliferation of, of uh, media channels from social media, TV, radio, really poses a challenge in terms of knowing who is responsible or where um, that um, dissemination channel comes from. However, you know, in a country like Nigeria, um, leadership has to come from the center, from the state health departments. They play a critical role in ensuring, first of all, that health information is accurately disseminated. Um, as I mentioned earlier, because of the multiple dissemination channels that are available to people, they should also tap into those similar channels to take responsibility for disseminating information. Um, and with a federal system that we have in Nigeria, the state governments, which we've noticed, especially with the COVID outbreak, have not been at the forefront of leading risk communication efforts. So state governments also have that primary role to lead um, in information dissemination. But then let's get down to the micro level. At the family level, parents, um, schools, these are also um, dissemination channels that are very critical for, for especially um, informing our youth population and ensuring that they uh, have access to the right information. So I think there are multiple stakeholders who have their responsibility in um, ensuring that accurate information, especially when we talk about health, is um, disseminated. Thank you. Toyin, is the world ready for this? Is the world ready for the accurate dissemination of health? And what does that look like from where you sit and the Wellbeing Foundation Africa? Thank you so much. Um, let me just make sure. Thank you so much, Gwen. Now, on a global scale, misinformation about health, racially sensitive issues and politics have actually spread rampantly via social media in recent years. COVID is not going to be the first time that we've seen that. And within that broader context of the global struggle, 
to actually verify the mass information that's being spread. We also have an, another challenge in Nigeria of managing preventable diseases and the encouragement of immunization. You know, since the early 1990s, it shows that we achieved universal immunization coverage of 81.5%. But since then, Nigeria has witnessed a gradual consistent reduction in coverage. So from the Wellbeing Foundation Africa, as soon as we realized that Nigeria had the COVID, you know, it didn't matter to whether it was one person or whether it was a thousand people. We actually used the WHO initially as the standard bearer, as well as keeping an eye on what the NCDC was doing. But we had to dig deeper than just the numbers of how many people have COVID today and how many people have been tested and how many people have died because we work at the front line. We work with pregnant women and women who have just newly delivered every single day and childbirth waits for no one. So a lot of the time we were having to craft through evidence-based research our own trusted information to be able to advise the women that we're working with. Yes, you can breastfeed your baby, but yes, you should wear PPE. This is how many times you should wash your hands. Perhaps you need to clean your surfaces better. And it was, um, it was a new world. But it wasn't an entirely new world because we were using the evidence of previous epidemics and infection prevention and control and WASH, which we had worked with before for very long, to actually craft our own trusted information. Our challenge then actually became, how do we get the information to our people in a lockdown? And at that point, we did what anybody else would do. We turned to digital techniques. Now, it, it's very important for me to say that information and the checking and reviewing of that information actually changes daily because COVID is a new virus, which we are all still learning about. So we never at the Wellbeing Foundation pat ourselves on the back and say, oh, yes, we know everything about this and this advice is never gonna change. We change, we review our advice, we adjust it every day and we contextualize it to make it make sense in the communities where we work. So for instance, if we're working in a densely populated urban slum and the advice says isolate, we know that that particular household cannot actually isolate one person unless that person goes to an isolation center. If it's an asymptomatic case, sometimes we've taken the decision to isolate the household while doing extra PPE measures within the house. But the important thing is to be sensible, to always check with the public system and to make sure that the advice that we give is actually evidence-based. That's fantastic. And that sort of feedback mechanism of adapting. I liked what you said about that, about learning and adapting. Dr. Roberts, welcome and for joining us today. Thank you. What, what, what do you want to add to that? What role does leadership play in really sort of taking this information, making sure it's heard and making sure it's disseminated, but adaptable to those local communities? What does leadership look like in this modernization and the digitization of information? To be honest, leadership is critical, and we have seen on both ends, at the state and the federal level, a disparity between the kind of leadership that we're getting. So I am not at all ashamed or hesitant to boast that Lagos State, in within the Federal Republic of Nigeria, mm -hmm. has done excellently in allowing leadership, in, in the leadership being led by the science, being evidence-based, leading okay. from the front, responding. And I keep reminding people, Lagos is a mini city in the, sen in the sense that, I mean, the population of Lagos alone is 20, edging on 25 million people. You know, so there is a lot of, there are a lot of competing demands and you could see that the, the, the leader, the incident commander himself, the executive governor, was being very responsive to the science to the healthcare workers while trying to mitigate the effect of the pandemic, for instance, on the, the population. So we had a whole risk communications team, which was being led by the public health physicians. We were on TV, we were on radio, 
a, a lot of us, all of us, not just one or two people, but we were doing it across board, looking at, you know, getting people, the medical officers of health, the intervention workers, everybody. And like Mrs. Saraki said, the information that we were giving out had to be crafted to fit the individual, the, the, the contextual need, as it were. So, yes, much of Lagos is very highly densely populated areas. So the issue of quarantining or isolating at home, staying in a separate room, using a separate bathroom, didn't fit with the contextual narrative that is going on there. So we now had to create what was effective. Of course, we were speaking in four or five different languages and, you know, and also inviting the questions and the dialogue from the grassroots so that they, we could get them to own the information, so to speak. So yes, digital techniques worked wonderfully with our pregnant women. We had situations where all our midwives set up WhatsApp groups. So the pregnant women, the women who had just had babies could ask very individual questions and get the plethora of information, of course, led by the midwife who would lead, give the information in a relevant manner led by the science. But leadership is critical. This is perfect. And this is great for the question, Vivian, I want to pose to you. You know, this year is being called the year of the nurse, the year of the midwife. And we talk a lot in Africa about community health workers. What's, what responsibility do they have? We talked about leadership, but what responsibility do these community health workers with the women and families themselves have? And, and what does this look like? This is, again, women on the front lines in COVID. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? I think you're on mute still. You're on mute. Okay. I'll be the catchphrase for 2020. Um, sorry. Um, I was just going to say that I think the need for um, health interventions and programs to have a gender lens has become especially apparent um, with COVID-19. As um, Mr. Sariki mentioned with what happened during the lockdown in reaching um, um, mothers at that very critical period. And this really elevates the need for uh, women in leadership and at the forefront, um, ensuring that um, they are playing a key role in disseminating um, health information. Um, I mean, I can give you a, a recent example of, you know, I was talking to um, some uh, some um, advocates who are pushing for uh, more, ad more um, advocacy around um, cervical cancer. And, you know, there's a, the, under the umbrella of the First Ladies Against Cancer, they are actively coming together um, and advocating for an urgent need to eliminate cancer. And, you know, they've also done a lot of work in revitalizing um, healthcare facilities. And I think critical, critically update in Nigeria, especially, we need a lot more women at that, in that, at that level to push forward and ensure that uh, women are adequately um, engaged and adequately um, informed about health interventions, especially when you look at things like sexual reproductive health. Again, midwives, um, midwives play a very important role because they are the ones who speak to mothers at that critical point when um, they're pregnant. Um, early this year, we did some work in primary healthcare centers in the north of Nigeria. And one of the key, th key things we found was a lot of women come for um, antenatal, so they come for one, two or three, but by the fourth visit, they disappear because, you know, in a way, culturally, when women are going to give birth, they give birth in communities. And I think that is a huge missing gap where, you know, we expect the women to come to health facilities to get antenatal care, and they're not coming because of, for cultural reasons, their husbands may prefer them to give birth at home. So that really emphasizes the need for community health workers to go into those communities, to speak to those women face to face, because that adversely impacts their outcomes when they do give birth, because often they're giving birth without the assistance um, of a skilled birth attendant. So, you know, midwives and nurses play that critical leadership role, especially at informing women um, on their options while they're pregnant and informing them about breastfeeding, about nutrition. But of course, let's not forget that post-pregnancy family planning is something that we don't often talk about. So antenatal visits and getting women at that point, it's a, it's a key teachable moment where, you know, midwives and nurses play a critical um, leadership role. I know I gave birth with the help of midwives and we need to really elevate the role of midwives in a country like Nigeria, where we sense that midwives are seen as secondary to nurses. Um, and, you know, through the, one, another project we did looking at um, women giving birth in communities, we were told by a lot of the mothers um, that, you know, when they go to facilities, um, the nurses are not always kind to them and are not always um, supportive. So midwives play that critical role in ensuring that the women have access to that continuum of care from pre-pregnancy, during pregnancy and post-pregnancy to ensure that the women are adequately informed um, to know what their choices are and to know how to stay healthy and keep their babies um, healthy as well. 
Yeah, the first two years are so critical. Toy, and I want to bring you in on the women's leadership, and let's not lose the fact that this is a panel of three women, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. But also, um, what what impact this misinformation has on the youth? Because I want to bring the youth in, because that's such a large segment of the population, and a lot of these women and boys growing up in these communities. So talk a bit about the women's leadership and then the impact of misinformation could have on the youth and where, what role the youth are playing in correcting this misinformation. Well, the first thing that I will say, I think anybody who looks at me will know that I'm the example of the revolutionary effect that a woman exhibiting her own agency and autonomy in leadership can do. You know, when I registered the Wellbeing Foundation Africa in 2004, the Corporate Affairs Commission sent the name back to me three times because they had never seen anything registered in Nigeria called foundation. But, you know, after a big push, they accepted that a foundation was different from a trust or a charity, and you could have a foundation to work towards a specific purpose. My purpose was always saving the lives of pregnant women and their newborns. And that was 2004. I think by 2006, I started hearing the word MNCH, maternal newborn and child health. And then we went from MNCH to RMNCAH, and now we've added the plus N nutrition. You know, I, I don't want to claim um, all the glory of that for myself, but I think where women's leadership counts is that actually, especially within our culture, if they see a woman do something and do something successfully, it does give rise to a bit of the, you know, it encourages other women, encourages young people, and it gives rise to the competitive spirit in some of the men, and they want to do better. So we all achieve better together. It takes a village to raise a child. I'm actually quite pleased to see youth, young people, coming to the fore of development. In 2015, I actually endowed a charity to progress youth expertise on African affairs in development. Since then, we have empowered, I think, 65 youth experts in 34 countries. And many of those have actually gone on to lead organizations. Every day, they are looking at the frontline challenges through a different lens. So for instance, a 22 year old community health worker will look at the issue of getting to the mother in the village hut differently from the 55 year old. The 55 year old one may say, oh, I need a taxi or I need a car. The 22 year old is happy to take an Uber as far as it goes and then take a go cat a bike and do the rest by boat. The important thing with this leadership is to make sure that we're reaching the last mile and that we're reaching the last mile, not with treatment or care that is okay for that context, but treatment or care, and this is where the youth really come in, that are what we know to be the globally acceptable standard. I'm seeing young women in Nigeria rise to the fore. I'm seeing young men in Nigeria, sharing the empathy and the understanding that we need, but we do need to have a deliberate pathway for them to grow up. To go back to the issue of the community health worker versus the nurse versus the midwife, it's important to understand that this dichotomy arose in Nigeria because Nigeria tried to impose a dual qualification during training. And then at the moment, Nigeria is trying to say, you must first be a nurse before you can be a midwife. I'm a proponent, I was ICM Global Goodwill Ambassador for six years, and I'm a proponent for direct entry midwifery. Both nursing and midwifery are noble professions that actually are quite different, even though they are both yeah. the caring professions. And what I've certainly seen at the Wellbeing Foundation Africa, where we've put midwives at the heart of trusted information to women freely, once a month, if you're coming to your antenatal class, and 24-7, if you're on our WhatsApp chat board, is that our women do come for their antenatal seven times during the pregnancy. And they do come back for their postnatal. And because we put midwives at the heart, if we don't see them back at the postnatal class, we do the postnatal visit as a community midwife to the home. Definitely in the areas where we have program saturation, that form of leadership has actually resulted in zero deaths. But the areas around us 
still have the deaths, still have the complaints about the lack of respectful maternity care. So what I think women's leadership does is women's leadership is more intentional towards a whole system, form of support that was actually had the resilience to be able to cope and respond to COVID, but we do need to marry this with the right investments to be able to have comprehensive community care, which is actually now the imperative, given the sort of referrals we need to do to treat COVID, we now need to remove that layer of primary, secondary, tertiary, and be able to provide comprehensive community care on people's doorsteps in the community under one roof. Wow. So Dr. Roberts, I'm gonna let you uh, maybe sort of close this because our 20 minutes is coming to a close, but what do we have to look forward with the COVID, the misinformation technology, tying the loop to the last mile, to the community health worker, to those in the communities. I like the Uber to the bike analogy. Um, are, we, are we getting better at this? What do we have to look forward in tackling misinformation in Nigeria? Can Definitely we are going to get better with the deck. I, I'm, no, I'm not muted. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, uh, definitely we're getting better because the, techno the digital technology we have available to us and the youthful population that we have means that we're going to just take this to the very next level of reaching the last mile and translating the present digital technology through chat to our chatbots and other um, interesting innovations to reaching the last mile and making sure that every mother and every child has access to quality health care and quality health information, quality health literacy. That's the important thing so that we can bring the, the information to them in a manner that they can relate with and resonate with and respond to. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you all. And thank you to Concordia and the Wellbeing Foundation. Thank you, Vivian, Toyn, and Alero. And I look forward to speaking with you further and enjoying the rest of the day at Concordia. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much.